What's up everyone, welcome back to The Film Room. If you've been following my Twitter, you would know that I've been gone for about a month now because of a minor medical issue I was dealing with, but don't worry about that anymore. I am healthy, I am back, and I am ready to release my first and only public mock draft of the year for all of you fine people. If you watched last year's mock draft special, I'm doing this year's mock the exact same way, and that means that I am not predicting what will happen later this week, what I am doing is drafting as if I am the general manager for all 32 teams and I'm using my own board and my own player evaluations. I'm drafting based on talent, scheme fit, future needs, salary cap considerations, everything, just like an actual front office would. As a result, my picks probably will not be accurate, at least in terms of predicting who goes where, but that's not really my goal, so honestly, I don't care about that. What I do care about is being able to look back on this mock in a year or three years or eight years and see how my evaluations stacked up with the actual production in the league. To echo my statement from 2017, if I'm going to be right or wrong, I at least want to be right by following my own gut rather than someone else's gut. So with that, let's start diving into these selections and with the first overall pick, I as the fake GM of the Browns am going with Sam Darnold, quarterback, USC. This is a pretty standard pick in most mock drafts, so I don't need to spend that much time on it, but I'll just say this. Every single QB in this class has their own issues, and they are all very different issues. We could see as many as six quarterbacks go in the first round, but none of them are Andrew Luck or Peyton Manning or John Elway. None of them are perfect. That being said, Darnold probably has the fewest major issues out of the top four. He's the safest quarterback prospect that checks the most boxes you want to see, even if his ceiling and overall talent are not as high as, say, Josh Allen or Lamar Jackson. Darnold is accurate, he's mobile, he's mature, and he has experience making full field reads both pre- and post-snap. Of course, mechanically, he is not as clean as Josh Rosen, and he doesn't have Josh Allen's arm strength or Lamar Jackson's speed, but he's good enough in all of those areas for me to give him a high, well-rounded grade. To me, what really puts him over the top of everyone else, though, is the clutch factor. In a big game, a big moment, when you need just one drive to get a win, he's going to remain calm under pressure and give you that drive. Whether it was in the Rose Bowl against Penn State a couple years ago or the Texas game this past season, time and time again he showed up in crucial situations and made the difference for his football team. That's what you want in a number one overall pick. You want a guy who, when the chips are down, he can make a difference. He can stand tall against the rush with his eyes downfield, make clutch throws into tight windows, and just go win the damn game. That is Sam Darnold to me, and that's why he should be the first overall pick. Whether or not Cleveland will fall for the allure of Josh Allen in the real drafts, I have no idea. But if it were me, I would just take the safest quarterback in this class and call it a day. Now, moving on to pick number two and the Giants, I get the sense that they're really aiming for more of a rebuild rather than a retool, and I personally agree with that approach. I don't really think that they're going to be in a position like this to draft Eli's successor again anytime soon, and even if they did pass on a quarterback for a top-tier talent like Saquon Barkley, I don't think that Barkley would immediately make them a Super Bowl contender either. So to me, if you aren't good enough to make a serious run at a ring right now, and you aren't bad enough to get another shot at a quarterback next year, you might as well take one while you can, and that's why I'm picking Baker Mayfield here. Mayfield is incredibly accurate, he has great touch both in the pocket and out of the pocket, and his arm strength is really underrated as well. Physically, he reminds me of Russell Wilson a lot, though maybe not quite as fast, but just as slippery within the pocket. I think with his accuracy, his work ethic, and his overall physical talent, he could be very, very good as a starting quarterback for a long time, and with a year to sit on the bench behind Eli, he would not be under as much pressure to immediately come in and master pro-style concepts and terminology. And that's not to say that he couldn't run the offense as a rookie, I think he could, but in New York he wouldn't have to, and that's a really big deal for his development. I think Patrick Mahomes really benefited from that time on the bench last year in Kansas City, and Mayfield could benefit from it in the same way. In terms of his maturity and all that, let me just say one thing and make it very clear. He is not Johnny Menzel. I know for a fact that several teams did not have Menzel on their draft board at all because he had well-known substance abuse issues at Texas A&M, which to his credit he seems to have cleaned up since then, but he was not clean when he was coming out of college and the Browns took him anyway. Mayfield does not have those kinds of issues. He does not have psychological problems like Manziel either. He just, quite frankly, did some dumb stuff that rubbed people the wrong way. 
the running from the cops while drunk thing, the sideline nut grab against Kansas thing, the planting the flag against Ohio State thing. Yeah, you could say you don't like him because you think he's a douchebag. That's perfectly fair, I guess, but he's not Manziel. And truth be told, everything I've heard from people around him and around the program is that he's a fantastic person and a fantastic leader. So personally, I'm not worried about his personality at all. I think the Giants are a perfect situation for him to adjust to the league, and if I were in Mayfield's camp, I would really hope that he goes to New York just for that very reason. You could argue that Josh Allen might benefit even more from having that guaranteed year on the bench, which may be true because Allen has a lot more work to do to fix himself, but to me, Baker is just straight up a better quarterback on tape, and his floor is way, way higher, so I'm going to go with him instead. Okay, on to pick number three and my third straight QB taken. This time it is Josh Rosen from UCLA going to the New York Jets. Rosen, at least on the field, is exceptionally clean. His mechanics are great. He's got a big arm. He's accurate. He processes defenses very quickly, and he has the confidence to make throws into the smallest of small windows. You could argue that sometimes his confidence even gets the better of him and he makes really stupid throws because maybe he believes in himself too much, but that's kind of the price of admission for some of the really amazing throws that come along with it. He's got some gunslinger to him, and if you're going to draft a gunslinger as your starting quarterback, you just have to be prepared for that play style and build around it. He's probably going to throw a boatload of picks as a rookie, that's just how he plays, and he'll need time to adjust to the league while he figures out what he can and cannot get away with. But at the same time, I want to urge patience because we saw the same thing with Andrew Luck when he was a rookie in Indianapolis. He made whatever throws he wanted at any time he wanted at Stanford just because he was so much better than everyone else in college and he can get away with it. Then he goes to the Colts and he's trying to make the same throws against the Patriots that he did against Cal and it just didn't work anymore. Rosen is going to have the same problem and he's going to have to learn from it just like Luck did. It's a big adjustment period when you're testing Dante Hightower over the middle instead of some no-name linebacker from Oregon, so if he has struggles in his first year, Jets fans, I urge you not to freak out about it. There is not a ton of talent around him in that offense that can cover for his mistakes, or at least not premier talent. He's going to need time to adjust, and this will likely be a two- or three-year process for everything to come together around him. Just cherish whatever flashes he gives you as a rookie, because believe me, there will be a lot of them, and get ready for the front office to start making some serious moves to build around him in year two, just like the Bears are doing with Mitch Trubisky. Chicago had a plan and stuck with it, and that's looking like it's going to pay off big time, and you as Jets fans just need to have faith in this plan as well. It's probably going to work, you just have to be patient. So with that, let's move on to pick number four, where the Browns are back on the clock once again. And for a long time, I've had Saquon Barkley slotted in here just because I wanted to make Sam Darnold's life as easy as possible. But over the last week or so, I've had a bit of a change of heart. Instead, I want to make Miles Garrett's life a little easier and give him an elite partner in crime in NC State's Bradley Chubb. Combined with Garrett and Emmanuel Ogba, Chubb would give the Browns an absolutely incredible edge rush rotation, and if a Darnold-led offense can give them even a little bit of a lead, they could make a quarterback's life hell as a unit. Who are you going to double in this scenario? Are you going to chip both of them on every single snap and basically just try to win with three downfield receivers? You could have the best receiving core in the league and that would still not be a viable game plan. Eventually, Chubb and Garrett will get their one-on-ones just because offenses will be forced into those situations and that's when they can wreck the game. I profiled Garrett last year before the draft and called him one of the best edge prospects to come out in the last decade, but believe me, Chubb is not that far behind him. The grade I gave him is equivalent to Khalil Mack when he was coming out of Buffalo in 2014. Not that they're the same player because their overall skill sets are kind of different, but just in terms of pure grade, they would be right next to each other on the big board. Chubb is extremely polished as a rusher. He has an arsenal of moves at his disposal, much more than your average college edge rusher, and he combines that polish with great burst, length, strength, and great bend for his size to be a truly well-rounded pass rusher. Like Garrett the year before, he is not just a one-trick pony. They can both win with speed or power, and they both are high-motor players that never quit on a play. If you thought Freeney and Mathis were a good duo, Chubb and Garrett can be just as productive. So while it would be nice to give Darnold another weapon to help him build those leads for his defense, in the end, I think it might be even more valuable to give him a pass rush that can protect those leads and close games out. Now, moving on to the Broncos at 5th overall, and here is where Saquon Barkley finally comes off the board. 
He is my highest graded player in this class, and for a full breakdown of his skill set, you can go watch the film room episode I did on him a couple months ago before the combine, but in short, he is a nearly flawless running back prospect. His grade is just slightly below Leonard Fournette's last year because I'm a sucker for power backs that can bludgeon defenses to death, but Barkley is only behind him by the smallest of small margins, and in my opinion, he's a completely different player than Fournette anyway, so it's really hard to directly compare them against each other. For instance, I don't think Fournette would be as successful in a zone scheme like the one Denver uses because he's more of a downhill gap runner, whereas Barkley is extremely comfortable in his own system and ran out of the shotgun the vast majority of his time at Penn State. Barkley is also more polished as a receiving option out of the backfield. He has such good lateral quickness too, and you can probably line him up in the slot as well, which is something I would never do with Fournette. Overall, just considering Barkley's versatility and his physical skill set that really lends itself well to zone schemes, I think he's a perfect match for a Broncos roster that is struggling for an identity. When Denver won the Super Bowl, they did it with dominant defense, competent quarterback play, and a strong running game, and right now, I don't know if they have any of those qualities anymore. Case Keenum might be able to give you some decent years as a bridge quarterback, but the running game is not what it used to be, and the defense is at a major crossroads. I think the safest option here is to kill two birds with one stone and give Keenum an explosive receiving weapon to work with out of the backfield as well as a drive sustaining ground attack all in one player. The defense will still have some questions to answer of course, but at the very least the support system around the quarterback will be improved. In the actual draft, Denver might go with Josh Allen here, and I would certainly understand why, but in all of the years of John Elway trying and failing to draft his own QB, the rest of the roster has suffered significant losses. Losses that, in my opinion, would hamper the development of a young quarterback anyway. So, for now, I'm just going to avoid taking another stab in the dark under center, and I'm going to rebuild the rest of the team first. Whenever I find my long-term option at quarterback in this draft, whether it's this year, next year, the year after that, whatever, at least he'll have some premium talent to grow with, which is really, really important to me. Now, next up, we have the Colts at sixth overall after their trade down with the Jets. And as the Colts GM, I am left with a huge early Christmas present in the form of Notre Dame's Quinton Nelson. The Colts line is not actually in that bad of shape with Kelly, Muhort, and Costanzo anchoring the left side. They just haven't been able to stay healthy, so the line has looked way worse than it really is. By adding Nelson as a plug and play option at right guard, if everyone else stops getting injured for once, then Indy should, on paper, have one of the better young lines in the league. And if I'm trying to build the team around Andrew Luck and keep his own injury issues from derailing yet another season, then he needs to be protected and he needs to stop taking vicious hits on every other snap. That's what Nelson can give me from day one, a clean pocket. A clean pocket means a healthy Andrew Luck, and a healthy Andrew Luck means that the Colts are back in contention for the division. Throw in the fact that Nelson is also an incredible run blocker and a leader on and off the field, and he's about as can't miss of a guard prospect as you'll ever see. Is he a flashy pick? Absolutely not, but he's the right one, and that's all that really matters. If you want a more detailed breakdown of what Nelson brings to the table, you can check out my film room episode on him on my channel page, but for now, let's move on to pick number seven. And here's where things get a bit crazy, because I already know that a lot of Bucks fans are probably going to hate this pick. But just know this, a lot of people hated when I picked Eddie Jackson in the top 12 last year too, and they wrote that whole mock off as garbage, and then Eddie four months later had a fantastic rookie year in Chicago. Just because nobody else in the media has this player going this high doesn't mean that I'm wrong, it just means that I have a different opinion. So with that, with all that preface out of the way, I'm taking Colorado cornerback Isaiah Oliver at 7 to Tampa Bay. I've gone on record in my last film room episode saying that I believe Oliver is the best cornerback in this class, and I detailed several reasons why, but the Bucks in particular need him on their roster more than almost any other team. Tampa is consistently punished year after year for not having any big starting caliber corners on the field. Tall physical receivers like Michael Thomas, Julio Jones, and Adam Thielen tore them to pieces and will continue to tear them to pieces in the future as long as they do not have any corners that can match up with that play style. You could argue that it's their single biggest weakness on defense and they've done virtually nothing to address it for two years now. So, as the fake Bucks GM in this mock draft, I'm finally going to address it. It is highly unlikely that Oliver will be there in round two, and we already know that I have him ranked as my first corner on the board, and he fits what Tampa needs most, so to me this is actually one of the easier picks for me to make in this whole mock. 
I don't think that Josh Jackson would solve their problems as a rookie because he's more of a zone corner and I don't necessarily trust him in press man yet. And both Denzel Ward and Jair Alexander would just be more of the same as small corners that get bodied by Thomas and Julio. In terms of skill set, scheme fit, and overall talent, Oliver is the only corner that fits the Bucks in round one, so this is the only pick I felt comfortable making. I'm sure I'm still going to get flooded with comments anyway telling me how wrong I am, but just trust me on this one. In a year or two, when he starts making Pro Bowls, he's going to change your mind. Now, moving on to the Bears at pick number eight, I've had Tremaine Edmonds going to Chicago for a while because he's an excellent fit there, but after watching more of Harold Landry and seeing the massive, massive hole at edge rusher across from Leonard Floyd, I'm slotting Landry in here instead. He is a straight up flamethrower coming off the edge, and were it not for an injury slowing him down in 2017, he'd probably be seen as a consensus top 10 pick. His dip and rip combo is exceptional, and he's able to bend so low that tackles have a lot of trouble trying to contain him coming off the edge. He's such a small target and so low to the ground that you just can't get a clean grip on him, and by the time you start to recover, he's already around the corner. I would venture to say that his sheer flexibility and fluidity reminds me almost of Von Miller, and even though he doesn't quite have Von's explosiveness or power, the bend alone is still enough for him to be a very, very good pass rusher in the pros. That bend and the balance, in my opinion, is probably Miller's most important asset on third downs, and Landry's got it too. As long as Floyd comes back healthy and Landry fully recovers from his own injury issues, this could be a scary pass rush duo for the Bears for many years to come. Next up at ninth overall, we have the 49ers, and given the off-the-field mess that Reuben Foster is proving to be, there is a decent chance he never plays another snap in San Francisco, or maybe even the whole NFL. Which is fine, I mean, I know that John Lynch traded up to get him, and on the field he showed flashes of being a really good player, but they don't need that kind of crap in their locker room right now. If he wants to go off and commit felonies literally months after this organization gave him a chance, that's on him. So, if I were the GM, I would just cut him right now and replace him immediately with a linebacker who's even more talented and also picture perfect off the field, Virginia Tech's Tremaine Edmonds. I broke down Edmonds' strengths and flaws on tape several weeks ago and said he was one of the most talented linebackers to enter the NFL, maybe ever, and I still feel that way. He's massive, he's blazing fast for his size, and he has the versatility to line up everywhere on the field. If you want him to cover a tight end at Sam, he can do it. If you want him stuffing the run as a Mike linebacker, he's fine there too. He's even explosive enough to get snaps at both edge rusher and as a defender in the slot. He can literally do everything. For my purposes though, I'm going to slide him into the Mike Backer spot on day one and let him be my clone of Bobby Wagner. As I said on my breakdown of him before, he has a ways to go before he develops the same instincts and discipline as Wagner, but his physical talent far exceeds almost every other linebacker in the league. So once that light bulb does switch on, he's going to be a perennially elite player. With the Niners defensive coordinator, Robert Sala, being responsible for the development of Wagner in the past when he was the linebackers coach in Seattle, I'm optimistic that Edmonds could turn into something really special under the very same coach. So hopefully all this works out for me in the end and the Niners can finally, finally find a proper replacement for Patrick Willis after years of painful trial and error. All right, rounding off the top 10, we've got the other team in the Bay, the Oakland Raiders embarking on their second first season under head coach John Gruden. And there's one particular player still left on the board that I think meshes very well with both what I want to accomplish on the field and what I want to accomplish as a culture, and that's Minka Fitzpatrick. Part of my job as a GM is to find players that mesh with my coaches, and very few players in this draft mesh with Gruden like Fitzpatrick does. His nickname at Alabama was Coach Saban's son because he was the only person in that whole program who was as obsessed with winning as Nick Saban. Fitzpatrick put in an unbelievable number of hours into the film room and the weight room, and he worked tirelessly to correct even the most minute mistakes he made during games. I mean, this is a guy who was once fuming on the sideline because he missed one assignment, and Damian Harris had to remind him that they were up by 40 points and to not be so upset with himself. Fitzpatrick absolutely despises not being perfect, and some would almost call it an unhealthy fixation with perfection, but that's the exact same fixation that Gruden has. They are both legitimately obsessed with football, and I think they could work very, very well together because of that mutual understanding. On the field, I would put Fitzpatrick at the free safety position from the moment he gets in the building, just as I said in my breakdown of his skill set last month, and with both Gary and Conley and Carl Joseph also in tow, now you've got three very talented first-round picks and former first-round picks in that secondary. 
They need a true free safety with range, ball skills, and instincts, and that's a role that Fitzpatrick can excel in. As long as everyone stays healthy, which was a huge issue for them last year, Oakland could have a pretty damn good young secondary on their hands. I'm very excited to see where they go from here. Moving along to the 11th pick with the Miami Dolphins, and I have a lot of options here. I could go quarterback, I could go running back, or defensive tackle, but instead I'm going to go with a player that a lot of other people have also been linking to Miami, and that's Roquan Smith. As I said in my breakdown of Smith a few weeks ago, he really needs a good fit for him to succeed, more so than either Tremaine Edmonds or Leighton Van Der Esch. Smith is a pure will linebacker, meaning he needs to play off the line of scrimmage and primarily as a pursuit player. He needs a good defensive tackle in front of him and a good Mike linebacker next to him to absorb as many blocks as possible so that he can just run free and make tackles unopposed. It's kind of like how Telvin Smith and Levante David operate in Jacksonville and Tampa Bay respectively. If he's used as the cleanup crew, he can be extraordinarily productive because he's so fast, so explosive, and so instinctive, but the second that you try to make him take on blocks as the point of attack, you're gonna have some problems. Oklahoma in particular abused him over and over again by running directly at him, and Roquan had little to no support that game from his defensive line or the Mike Backer, so whoever his future NFL team ends up being is going to have to commit to protecting him from that. Georgia did not protect him against Oklahoma, and they almost paid dearly for it. In Miami, he'll have a pair of really nice, young, underrated defensive tackles in Jordan Phillips and Devon Godshaw, who both had good years in 2017, and he'll have a true Mike backer next to him that I liked a lot coming out of Ohio State in Raekwon McMillan. I think both Roquan and Raekwon complement each other very well in terms of their individual skill sets, and remember Kiko Alonso was also there too, so as long as McMillan is fully recovered from his torn ACL, the Dolphins could have themselves a really, really good young linebacking core. And if Phillips and Godshaw also keep developing at their current trajectory, this front seven is going to sneak up on some people in 2018. With Roquan in the fold, this could be one hell of a front to try to run against. They still probably won't win the division, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that their defense turns them into legitimate wildcard contenders. At least to me, it would not be the most surprising storyline if they had a bounce back year, so just watch out for that. Now, on to pick 12 and the Bills, and Josh Allen is finally coming off the board. I suppose it's kind of unrealistic to mock him this late because you've got teams like the Cardinals, Ravens, and maybe even the Chargers or Steelers or Patriots who could all be trying to trade up to secure their future. But since I do not have trades in this mock, he managed to fall all the way to 12. Out of the big four, I have him going last because his issues, at least to me, are far and away the most worrisome of that group. Darnold's fumble problem, Mayfield's run-in with the police, and Rosen's concussions are all things that I have varying degrees of concern about, but after watching Allen's tape again last week for what seems like the 10th time, I just could not shake the underlying gut feeling of fear about taking him. I love the arm on tape, I love how he can effortlessly make throws from the far hash to the boundary without even breaking a sweat, those are throws that some quarterbacks just cannot make, but his accuracy is really inconsistent. And yes, a lot of that is because of his mechanical problems like overstriding and all that. I get it, but I learned a pretty severe lesson from Christian Hackenberg a few years ago that perfect mechanics cannot fix everything in a wild, strong-armed quarterback. Sometimes dudes are just not consistent, and no amount of tweaking can completely change that. Darnold, Mayfield, and Rosen all make perfectly accurate throws from bad platforms or during rushed releases all the time, and they have no issues doing that. So why is it that Allen missed several routine throws even when he was not under duress? It's just something that's really hard to swallow for me, and maybe it's because I've got a little scouting PTSD from Hackenberg, but that's just where I'm at with him. On top of that though, Allen really tended to get stuck when progressing through his reads, or at times he had to wait and see his receiver get open before throwing it rather than throwing with anticipation, and to be fair, he had such a good arm that he was still able to hit some of those windows anyway, but that's not really going to work in the NFL. You have to be able to throw with anticipation in the pros or you won't be successful, and he just doesn't do that enough yet. He clearly needs the most work out of all the big four quarterbacks, and if he played at all as a rookie, I think it would be a mistake. He needs to get the Pat Mahomes treatment and just ride the bench for a year, which is why I'm a bit more comfortable with him in Buffalo now that they signed AJ McCarron. I mean, truth be told, if I were the Bills, I probably would not trade up to 12 for Allen in the first place, but they already did the trade and we already know they're going to take a quarterback, so I'm kind of stuck taking him even if I don't want to, but anyway, that's besides the point. I'm a bit more at ease taking Allen for the Bills than, say, the Cardinals, because at least I know McCarron is probably going to play more than four or five games, and I cannot say the same thing about Sam Bradford. 
If Allen is going to be successful, he really should not see the field as a rookie. He is nowhere near ready. McCarron being the starter means Allen can sit as the number two or maybe even number three quarterback and just learn. It is highly likely that new offensive coordinator Brian Dable will implement a lot of the Earhart Perkins concepts that he got from the Patriots, and believe me, those take a long time for a quarterback to learn, especially if they're young, so the more time Allen gets to sit, the better. Overall, I'm just chalking this pick up to this. I love Allen's talent, but I don't love his tape. I'm taking him this high only because I kind of have to, and hopefully for both his sake and the Bills' sake, his year on the bench behind McCarron helps him to work out those flaws. I don't expect him to be a great quarterback, but if he and his coaches work hard enough to get him up to speed, he can probably at least be a good quarterback, which would obviously make this pick worth it. Fingers crossed, I guess, but I don't know. Anyway, next up we got Washington at 13, and I'm going with Vita Vea here from the other Washington. They really need help on the defensive line, especially at nose tackle, so Vea is a perfect fit. He's extraordinarily powerful at the point of attack, he can collapse the pocket on third downs, and he has a motor that never ever quits. Hell, considering his size, he's probably one of the most overall athletic defensive tackles to come out of college in the last five years, which is really saying something. His presence on the nose is going to be hugely beneficial for keeping Mason Foster and Zach Brown clean on the second level, which should mean a nice overall boost for a run defense that placed dead last in the NFL in 2017. The Cowboys live and die by their run game, the Eagles won a Super Bowl off the back of the run pass option, and the Giants will at the very least probably attempt to run the ball a lot under Pat Shermer and Mike Shula, so if Washington wants to survive the NFC East, they need to get better against the run, and they need to get better fast. Vea, in my opinion, can help them make that improvement. Moving on to pick 14, we've got the Green Bay Packers with one of the rare high first round picks for that organization in the last 25 to 30 years. They more than likely will not be back in the top 15 for quite a while, so I'm going to make it count by taking Denzel Ward from Ohio State. The Packers really, really need corner help, and I think Ward has the potential to be the Casey Hayward replacement that they've desperately been searching for since he left town. He's blazing fast, has fluid hips, great footwork and hand placement, and reminds me a lot of Desmond Trufant when he was coming out of Washington. He's not the biggest corner in the world, so he's probably going to struggle a little bit with tall, physical receivers, but just like Trufant, he is so fast and so fluid that anyone under 6'2 is probably going to be in for a long day against him. He's the perfect antidote for guys like Golden Tate and Stephon Diggs inside of their own division, let alone other shorter number one threats in the NFC like Brandon Cooks and Odell Beckham. As long as the Packers let Kevin King match up with the big bodies like Allen Robinson and Adam Thielen, Ward can take care of the rest. He's an excellent value at 14th overall, and if he's there in the actual draft, I would expect Green Bay to make the exact same move. And that brings us to the Cardinals at 15, who are in a horrible position because they were not bad enough to tank for a quarterback last season, but also nowhere near good enough to make the playoffs. And on top of that, Carson Palmer is now retired and their starting QB is a half-broken Sam Bradford, so they're kind of just screwed in this organizational limbo right now. They don't have the ammo to outbid the Bills for a trade-up, even if they wanted to, and there's no way in hell any of the top four quarterbacks fall to them, so as general manager, I really only have one option. Take the best player available at a position of need that will specifically improve the roster for a quarterback being acquired next year. That means weapons or protection, first and foremost. If I can't get a signal caller this year, then I at least need to make an effort to make the roster more hospitable for next year's QB class, whoever they may be, which is why I'm going with Mike McGlinchey from Notre Dame. McGlinchey, I think, gets a bad rep because of that terrible Miami game, but on the whole, he's still a really solid offensive tackle prospect. He's not a great athlete, but he's a good athlete, and he has all the size and length you want at the position. His technique and discipline are also very, very good compared to most college tackles thanks to Harry Heastand, who coached him at Notre Dame, and I think he could slide in at right tackle from day one ahead of Andre Smith. Best case scenario, he can stay on that right side for the next 8-10 to 10 years and make the transition a little easier for whoever the Cardinals get in next year's draft. My priority for this team is obviously building for a run in 2020 rather than 2018, and McGlinchey is the first step in that rebuild. With any luck, I'll be in a better position next year as the Cardinals GM to make some moves and secure my quarterback of the future, but until then, I'll just have to make do with Bradford and see what happens. Alright, pick 16 now with the Ravens, which means we're officially at the halfway point of this mock, 
And I gotta say, Baltimore is in just as terrible a position as Arizona, in my opinion. I think it's become pretty clear that Joe Flacco is never going to get better. It's become clear that the front seven is gonna have to keep carrying this roster for all eternity. And because of the team's crippling injury history every single season, there's a decent chance that they're gonna be right back to picking in the middle of the first round next year as well. That means too late for an elite quarterback and too early for the quote unquote value quarterback. As an organization, they are consistently just good enough to not get better. And it's so infuriating to watch because it's like the NFL's version of purgatory. Just like with the Cardinals, I know that the Ravens probably won't compete for the division this season. Not because they aren't talented, which they are, but because we already know that Joe Flacco is not good enough to compensate when people start getting hurt. By the time next year's draft rolls around, Terrell Suggs will be another year older and possibly retired, Flacco's cap hit will still be gigantic, and Baltimore fans everywhere will be collectively beating their heads against the nearest brick wall they can find. So to deal with all of that, I'm gonna do something you probably will not expect, and that's steer into the skid. I'm going with Marcus Davenport, edge rusher, UTSA. Does taking another pass rusher solve the Flacco problem? Absolutely not. Does it give the team any long-term options at receiver? Nope. Does it improve the depth for an offensive line that was ravaged by injuries last year? Still no. But what it does do is give me a plan for how to deal with life after Terrell Suggs, which is coming up really fast for this organization. Sure, I could reach a little bit for James Daniels or Billy Price at center. I could grab Cortland Sutton or Calvin Ridley at receiver, and we know how much the Ravens love Bama players after all. Or I could take Lamar Jackson and just completely blow up the draft. But I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna look at my board, look at a roster full of things to fix, and just attack one problem at a time. Replacing Terrell Suggs might not be the biggest problem, I'll give you that, but it is a problem and this is a very weak edge rusher class. If I don't get Davenport here, then I might not get to replace Suggs at all in this draft and I'll have to weigh that need against future needs next year and I don't really wanna be put in that position. I would rather just fix what I can fix right now, today, and deal with everything else later. If I can get a good receiver and a good center on day two, great. If I have to give up a bunch of picks and trade up for a quarterback in 2019, that's fine, but I'll cross all of those bridges when I get there. For now, I'm taking Davenport and calling it a first rounder well spent. Now, as for what Davenport can bring to the table, he is a gifted athlete that is pretty much a blank slate technique wise. He reminds me a lot of Ziggy Ansah coming out of BYU who was just as freaky athletically, but also just as raw. There are a lot of snaps where Davenport gets tangled up for absolutely no reason when he is far and away more physically gifted than the tackle blocking him, and he should be dominating, but usually those plays just come down to not really knowing how to leverage himself or use his hands. But then all of a sudden he'll have a rep with perfect leverage and he'll extend his arms and use his length and he just completely runs over the tackle and you say, yes, that's what he can be. Those are the kinds of plays I'm drafting him for. I'm drafting him so that my coaching staff can mold him into being that kind of player on every snap. Because if they succeed in doing that, he can have just as productive a career as Suggs has had. He has the gifts to be that kind of player. It's going to take time for him to get there, yes, but considering that the Ravens have been spinning their wheels as an organization for what seems like five or six years now, they kind of have all the time in the world. So let's put the quarterback issue on hold, let's not reach too hard for a receiver or a center, and let's just fix what we can fix. In a couple years when the Ravens pass rush picks up where it left off in the post-Suggs era, trust me, you'll like the pick. Okay, moving on to the Chargers at pick 17, LA really doesn't need that much to become a legitimate contender. They don't have that many holes, and at least to me, they're the favorites to win the AFC West next season as long as they stay healthy. But they do have an opportunity in the first round here to finally replace Eric Weddle, so that's what I'm going to do. With that in mind, I am going with Jesse Bates out of Wake Forest to fill that need that, in my opinion, has been there for a couple of years. He's a true single high free safety, which Gus Bradley desperately wants in order to fill out his base cover three scheme, and I think he can immediately take over the starting position and improve this pass defense by a lot. He's got a ton of range, very good ball skills from his background as a baseball player, and you can even bump him down to play in the slot from time to time if you need to as well. He's got a very similar skill set to Eddie Jackson last year, who you'll all remember I loved as a prospect, and it would not surprise me to see him have just as much success as a rookie as Jackson did in 2017. Linebacker is of course still a very big need too, and I considered Leighton Van Der Esch for a long time at this pick, but Ultimately, free safety is such a valuable position in this scheme that I could not pass up a talent like Bates to fill it. 
he could be a really special player in this system or any cover three team in the league, really. So keep an eye on him next year. He's going to surprise a lot of people, regardless of what team he ends up on. Now, onto the Seahawks at pick 18, and Seattle's going through kind of a minor rebuild right now, which I agree was very necessary. It was it was time to do it, in my opinion. And in the spirit of that rebuild, I want to strengthen the strongest pillar that still remains on the team, and that's Russell Wilson. The Legion of Boom has a lot of question marks right now. We don't know what the front seven's going to look like, and the run game was an absolute travesty last season. So the only real identity that the team has left is Wilson. They will only go as far as he takes them, so I'm going to give him some much-needed help in the form of Isaiah Wynn from Georgia. Wynn is one of my favorite offensive line prospects in this entire class. He played left tackle in college, but because of his lack of size, he's only 6'3 with 33 and a half inch arms, he probably projects more to guard in the NFL. That being said though, his athleticism is top notch and he is just as quick, if not quicker, than most elite tackle prospects. He has the feet of a tackle and excellent discipline with his hands, and were it not for his lack of length, I think he could very easily play tackle at the next level. So by kicking him inside, I think he's gonna basically be another version of Zach Martin. Keep in mind that Martin also had the same problem coming out of Notre Dame where he had great feet as a left tackle, but short arms, so he played guard in Dallas and became an instant all pro. That's the same trajectory that I think Wynn will have in the NFL. Just like Martin, he's so damn quick and technically proficient that he can keep up with all these fast, undersized three techniques that are dominating the league. But he's also got excellent leverage and power to stand up against bull rushes as well. Aaron Donald has been terrorizing this offensive line ever since he came into the NFL, so it's about time I draft myself a guard that actually matches up well with him. Even if Wynn's presence just makes Wilson's life a little bit easier against the Rams twice a year, he will be well worth the investment. Alright, next up we got the team who, speaking of Zach Martin, actually drafted him back in 2014, the Cowboys, and despite picking in the back half of the first round, they're facing a rather large series of problems at the moment. Dak Prescott had a noticeable sophomore slump with Zeke Elliott sidelined by suspension, the defense was below average in almost every category, and now Des Bryant is no longer even on the roster. That last issue in particular is most troubling of all because this is a team that first and foremost needs to support Prescott's development, and right now his top two receiving options are Alan Hearns and probably Cole Beasley. That is simply not going to cut it. Dak himself may be an average quarterback, I think the jury is still out on that question if he's average or above average, but it's going to be hard for him to grow beyond that average production if he has no legitimate wide receiver one to throw to. It's the exact same problem the team faced before they drafted Dez, ironically enough, when their top two receiving options were Miles Austin and Jason Witten, which wasn't bad, but neither one of them was a number one receiver, which is what Tony Romo needed the most at the time. So if we want Dak to have even a remote chance of developing the same way that Romo did, he needs to have his own younger version of Dez Bryant, or Terrell Owens if we want to go back even further in Tony's career. With that in mind, I'm taking Cortland Sutton from nearby SMU. Sutton has a positively massive catch radius at 6'4 with a 36 inch vert, which is essentially identical to Dez, who was 6'2 with a 38 inch vert. If you throw the ball anywhere in his vicinity, he's big enough to box out corners and go up and get it, which should be very important for replacing Bryant's production in the red zone. On top of that, he's also got sneaky deep speed and is really nimble after the catch for being in such a big frame, so he's kind of got a little bit of everything in his game. You could argue that his route tree is not exactly developed compared to say Calvin Ridley or Christian Kirk, but it's not like Bryant ran more than four different routes either. If you only run a slant, post, out, over, and go in college, that's totally fine with me as long as you're really dominant on those routes, and Sutton was really, really dominant on those routes. Also, his production of 68 catches for over 1,000 yards and 12 touchdowns probably would have been a lot higher if he had any semblance of good quarterback play, so that's something to take into account as well. Overall, I think Sutton is a true wide receiver one prospect that can compete for starter snaps immediately, and he has the physical skill set to become a dominant player in the league within a few years. I recognize that it's highly unlikely he's the first receiver off the board in the real draft later this week, because everybody seems to love DJ Moore and Calvin Ridley, of course, but if I were the GM, he would be my pick to replace Des Bryant in a heartbeat. Now, on to pick 20 with the Detroit Lions, and I'll admit that I'm making this pick for kind of selfish reasons, and that's that I'm really, really tired of seeing the exact same stat pop up on a lower third in every single Lions game for the last four years. Detroit has not had a 100-yard rusher since Thanksgiving of 2013. I get it. 
okay? I, I get it. Seriously, every game it gets brought up, and no matter what we've done as an organization, we still can't find a running back that can even accidentally have a 100-yard game. So I'm foregoing addressing perhaps a couple more pressing needs in order to take one of the highest ranked players on my board that can also help make that stat finally go away, and that's Darius Geis from LSU. And here's the thing with Geis, when you evaluate him, you kind of have to ignore the 2017 tape because he was injured virtually the entire year. He was effective, but he wasn't really himself, or at least not the best version of himself. If you go back to 2016, however, you see the dominance on tape. You see the speed, the balance, the burst, the lateral agility, the power, the vision, all of it. He was a very well-rounded back. LSU was fortunate that season to have two franchise running backs on their roster, and even when Leonard Fournette's ankle injury kept bothering him and causing him to miss some time, the run game never really missed a beat because Geis was almost as good. I know we can't entirely blame Detroit's run game problems on their running backs because their offensive line has been kind of up and down the last several years, but even with those O-line problems, Amir Abdullah and Dwayne Washington still just were not getting the job done. I don't think that signing LeGarrette Blunt is going to help fix that problem either, so we've got a depth chart full of average to below average backs right now. Detroit needs a true bell cow that has the speed to break off long runs outside the tackles and the power to move the chains inside the tackles, and guys can be that kind of back. I realize the defensive end, defensive tackle, and strong safety are all arguably bigger needs, but as GM for this team, I'm just sick and tired of having a terrible run game. I'm tired of making Matt Stafford do everything by himself, and it's time that something be done to share the load. So give me Darius Geis at 20, and hopefully he can put an end to this terrible, terrible streak. All right, at pick 21, we have the Bengals, who, if you'll remember, traded back with the Bills, who took Josh Allen at 12, and this is a really advantageous spot for Cincinnati, in my opinion. One of their top needs on the whole roster is at center, which is not typically a position you want to address in the top 12 picks, so it makes a whole lot of sense to trade with the Bills, get a left tackle in that trade with Cordy Glenn, and then be in a better pick range in the early 20s to take the position we wanted to address all along anyway. So with center being the biggest need on the board and Cincy being in a better spot in the draft to hit that need, I'm going with James Daniels from Iowa. Daniels is a pure zone center through and through who reminds me a lot of Alex Mack on tape. His quickness is simply absurd out of his stance, to the point where I've seen him even successfully reach block a three technique. A reach block across two full gaps is maybe the hardest block any center could ever execute, simply because you have to cover so much ground to get across to the front side of that three technique, and only the most athletic of centers could even attempt that block. He is extremely nimble in space as a puller, which makes me think he would be perfect for executing those pin and pulls that have been a staple of the Bengals run game for years, and his quickness really translates in pass protection when he's passing off and receiving stunts as well. He does have a little bit of an issue with power sometimes because his anchor is only average at best, but what he sacrifices in strength he more than makes up for with quickness, fluidity, and versatility. With the Bengals employing so many zone concepts and counter concepts in their run game, they really, really need an athletic center to make it all work, and I think James Daniels can be that guy for them. So, all in all, if I'm Cincy's GM and I found a way to get both a franchise left tackle and a franchise center in James Daniels all in one round, and I managed to pick up an extra fifth round pick to boot in that trade, I'm pretty happy with that, and I'll bet Andy Dalton's pretty happy about it too. Moving on to pick 22 with the team that was on the other end of that trade, the Bills, making their second appearance in this mock draft. And as a result of them trading away Cordy Glenn and Eric Wood retiring and Richie Incognito seemingly retiring or maybe not or whatever the hell's going on with him, I, I have no idea. But no matter what, we've got some serious offensive line issues here in Buffalo. And since I'm not a masochist and I actually want Josh Allen to have a decent chance of succeeding, I need to give both him and AJ McCarron some protection. Enter Connor Williams, a tweener guard slash tackle from Texas who some people have rated as the top offensive tackle in this class. Personally, I think he's a guard because just like Isaiah Wynn, his lack of length is a little bit concerning, but the Bills could use both tackle and guard help, so what position he's drafted as doesn't really matter that much. They can try him all over the line until he sticks somewhere, and I'm willing to bet that this will be at either left or right guard in the long term. His kick set is pretty good by guard standards, and his hand placement and power are both above average as well. I suppose you can knock Williams for not having any one singular trait that's elite, like Wynn's quick feet or Quentin Nelson's raw power, but 
He's such a solid all-around player that I think he can be a good starter in the league for a long time. He's a classic meat and potatoes kind of pick, someone where you know what you're getting from day one, and with this organization already taking a massive risk earlier in this mock by drafting the ultimate unknown in Josh Allen, taking a player like Williams who is easy to project is a nice counterbalance to that. So looking at Buffalo's overall offensive renovation, I think they have a pretty good foundation to build off of in this scenario. McCarron, I think, can be a decent bridge starter for them for a year, probably no worse than Tyrod Taylor was, and if Incognito does come back, then they should have a pretty good guard tandem with Williams there too. And they really like Deion Dawkins as a high upside prospect at left tackle as well. Shady McCoy is still there, Kelvin Benjamin and Charles Clay are a decent one-two punch as receiving options, and there's still a chance for them to add even more receivers or offensive linemen in round two with picks 53 and 56. If we commit to the strategy of taking Josh Allen high and then using the rest of the draft to build the offense around him for 2019 or 2020, his transition could be successful. Just like with the Cardinals and the Ravens, I'm not building for a run this season. I'm building for a run three years from now and then every year consecutively after that. If that means Buffalo doesn't return to the playoffs again this season, so be it. But if we're committing to this rebuild around a risky quarterback, then I'm sure as hell going to do it the right way. That means sign me up for Connor Williams, sign me up for some receivers in round two, and let's make life as comfortable for McCarron and Allen as humanly possible. And with that, let's go to pick 23, which sees the Super Bowl runner-ups and the Bills division rival, New England, trading up with the Rams in exchange for Brandon Cooks. It's been a while since the Pats picked this high, but usually when they do pick in the early to mid-20s, they get pretty damn good value. The last time they were in this range, which was also the last time they had multiple first-round picks, they took Chandler Jones and Dante Hightower at picks 21 and 25, respectively, which I think we can all agree were the right choices at the time, even if one of them isn't in the roster anymore. I'm going to put on my Bill Belichick hat right now and take someone who I think is a similarly good value in Florida State's Derwin James. James, to me, is the ultimate Bill Belichick type of player. He eats, breathes, and sleeps football, and he will do anything, and I mean anything, for the team. You want him at linebacker? He'll put on weight and play linebacker. You want him in the slot? He will work tirelessly to learn off-cover footwork and become a slot defender. You want him at free safety? He'll do whatever it takes to perfect that role, too. It, of course, helps that he's an elite athlete that can do all of those positions if he wants to, but it's the work ethic that really sets him apart. He's not just an athlete, he's a tough-as-nails leader, and when you draft him, you're not just drafting a safety or a linebacker, you're drafting a culture. In my opinion, culture has always been the Patriots' greatest weapon. They're not just a collection of players and systems, they're a team. They win as a team, they practice as a team, they learn and grow as a team. When you go to New England, you have to commit your whole mind, body, and soul to the organization, and I think Derwin has the perfect mindset to be a star in that environment. As far as on the field, I think they can use him as kind of a hybrid, strong safety, dime linebacker type of matchup player. On obvious passing downs, he can play linebacker and handle coverage duties against scat backs in space, which they were woefully unequipped for last season, and in base packages, he can play strong safety and patrol the box against the run. This would of course kind of relegate Patrick Chung to kind of a situational dime safety role, but to be honest, he was probably going to be in New England for only one or two more years anyway. Chung is not the kind of player that's going to make me pass on a talent like Derwin James, especially when he managed to fall so late in this mock, so I'll just scoop him up while I can and figure out the rest later. Now, moving on to pick 24 and the Carolina Panthers. This team has a major deficiency at boundary corner, and there happens to still be a pretty good boundary corner on the board in Iowa's Josh Jackson, which makes this a pretty easy pick for me. Jackson's more of a zone corner than a pure man corner, which means he's kind of reliant on system fit right now, but that's okay because the Panthers are a zone heavy cover three team anyway. He fits exactly what they want in their outside corners, which is range, instincts, and ball skills, and he should be able to slide in across from James Bradbury on day one and start producing. With so many great receiving tandems in this division with Thomas and Meredith, Evans and Jackson and Jones and Sanu, the Panthers really cannot afford to screw around anymore at outside corner. They've been trying unsuccessfully to replace Josh Norman for two years now, and it has not gone well. Bradbury's had his moments, of course, but I don't think he's a true shutdown corner like Norman was. Jackson at least has a chance to be that guy in my opinion, so I really have no choice but to take him here to fill that hole. If I don't draft him, then I'm basically just resigning this team to another year of Michael Thomas doing whatever the hell he wants to on every single snap, and I'm sure Panthers fans are sick of that, so it's about time we put a stop to it. And that brings us to the Titans at 25th overall. 
Tennessee has a massive linebacker problem. In fact, you could argue that their inside linebacker situation is far and away the worst in the league, but luckily for me as the Titans GM, I've got a really damn good Mike linebacker prospect still on the board in Leighton Van Der Esch from Boise State. Van Der Esch, both athletically and in terms of play style, is very similar to Anthony Barr. He's got a big, imposing frame, he's extremely fluid and explosive in space, and he plays with an aggressive, penetrating style against the run that produces a lot of big plays. He's also a fantastic coverage linebacker, especially in zone coverage, and he should be able to control the middle of the field against everything from tight ends in the seams to running backs underneath. My one complaint with him is that he tends to take on blocks at the point of attack with his shoulders rather than his hands because he's just trying so hard to penetrate all the time, which then causes him to get stuck on blocks and kind of lose his run fits, but that's a pretty coachable issue in my opinion. I see no problems with his instincts, and his aggression tends to lead to a lot more big plays for the defense than the offense. If you expect him to come in and be that classic stack and shed Mike Backer in the mold of D'Amico Ryans or Dante Hightower, you're probably going to be disappointed. But if you're willing to just let him freelance a little bit, work through traffic aggressively, and fly to the ball at all times, he can give you triple digit tackles every single season. I think the Titans have good enough interior line talent with Jarrell Casey and Benny Logan to allow Van Der Esch to have that freedom, so I've got no problems taking him here. He's a great fit for the personnel they've got in place, and he certainly has the physical talent to become an immediate impact player from the jump. Next up, we've got the Falcons at pick 26, and this is a really intriguing team to me because on paper they should be seen as one of the elite clubs in the NFC, but they've been kind of overshadowed this whole offseason by the Vikings, Rams, Saints, and Eagles. And I'll just say this, don't be shocked if they return to the conference championship next year because they were really damn close to getting there in 2017 and they have not gotten any worse. Their only real loss in free agency was Dontari Poe, who won't be that hard to replace. So right now, just looking at their current roster, future needs, and of course planning for how to get by the rest of the heavyweights in the NFC, I'm thinking of going back to the Florida well and taking defensive tackle Taven Bryan. Brian, at least in this scheme, would likely play a Michael Bennett type of role. He's the rare kind of athlete who has three technique dimensions, but the explosiveness of a 4-3 end. He's always the first guy off the ball, and his first step is insanely quick. It's right up there with Aaron Donald, in my opinion. He's got that much juice. Now, he's not nearly as developed with his hand usage as Donald, and he doesn't really rush with a plan like Donald, but Dan Quinn's background as a very good defensive line coach I think can really help unlock Brian's immense potential. As a rookie, I would put him as the strong side end replacing Brooks Reed, and then on passing downs, kick him inside to a four eye or a three technique next to Vic Beasley. And then you've got those two along with Grady Jarrett and Tack McKinley, just totally overwhelming offensive lines with their combined explosiveness. All four of them have deadly first steps, and you can't double everyone at once. If Brian and McKinley eventually refine their game just like Beasley and Jarrett did, Atlanta could have an incredibly good pass rush package on third down. Like, that's a front four that could completely break the will of an offense if they get into a 10-point hole. So if I were Atlanta's GM, I would run that card in as fast as humanly possible. You can never have enough pass rush, after all. Now, moving on from the Falcons, let's go to their biggest and most bitter rivals at pick 27, the Saints. New Orleans is in a similar spot to Atlanta right now, where they don't have a ton of major holes, and they're primed to make a deep playoff run this year, provided they nail their picks and reload some key talent from the draft. My goal here is to just fix the most immediate gaps in the roster that I can, so that we can go win a championship right now while Drew Brees is still around for another two or three years. First things first, that means retooling the tight end depth chart and giving Brees yet another versatile weapon to throw to by drafting South Carolina's Hayden Hurst. Hurst is my top ranked tight end and he fits the Saints like a glove. He's incredibly athletic and was used as everything from an H-back to a slot receiver to even a running back on sweeps in the Gamecock offense. Sean Payton can use him a million different ways, but really his best trait is the speed and fluidity with which he runs his routes. Hurst is basically just a giant wide receiver, and he's so quick in his breaks that he's probably going to give linebackers a lot of problems in man coverage. I know that Lamar Jackson is an option here, and I was figuring that either New Orleans or Pittsburgh would be the absolute latest he would go, but really, I think the Saints have enough time left with Breeze that they can still look for their QB of the future in the next two draft classes that come along. And they are so, so close to getting a Lombardi that I don't want to just shut everything down right now and start building around a rookie for the following year. I want to make my run right now. 
If anything, the Steelers are both further away from being Super Bowl ready, and Ben Roethlisberger is probably closer to retiring than Breeze, which is exactly why I'm putting Lamar Jackson with them at 28 instead. And this may be wild speculation on my part, but I really get the sense that this is Big Ben's last year. I think he's going to make one more run with Brown and Bell and that offensive line and see what happens, and regardless of the outcome, I think he walks away in 2019. Now, on paper, I also think that there are at least six or seven teams that are better than Pittsburgh, and potentially even more depending on how much you like certain quarterbacks. So to me, the odds are kind of stacked against them for winning a ring this year. Even though they play in an easier conference and they might have an easier time making the playoffs in the first place, as a roster, I think they're further behind all the other top tier teams than most people think. So in taking Lamar Jackson, I'm both acknowledging that Roethlisberger is probably going to retire earlier than all the other old guard quarterbacks, while at the same time acknowledging that the window for this team is not as open as it was just one year ago. We really need to have a plan in place for a minor rebuild, however despite saying that, I also believe that this rebuild for the Steelers is way different than the one that the Cardinals, Ravens, and Bills are going through. Unlike all of those teams, Pittsburgh actually has a lot of talent in place that can help a young quarterback, so they can afford to reach a little bit and take one because the structure is already there. Le'Veon Bell, Antonio Brown, and Juju Smith-Schuster is a fantastic trio of weapons, he's got a good offensive line in place, and other than a very inconsistent defense, the team itself should be able to support a young QB that is going through growing pains. Arizona and Baltimore cannot say the same thing, or at least not to the same degree. So while yes, I agree that all these teams could target Lamar Jackson and sit him for a year behind their respective veterans, the Steelers are far and away the best situation for him to be in in that group. Jackson has a ton of mechanical issues that lead to inaccuracy, I realize that, and of course some people are also questioning if he can mesh well with their coaching staffs on a personal level, but hell, to me if you can mesh with Bobby Petrino, you can mesh with anyone, so I'm not that concerned about it. Overall, he's a very similar prospect to Josh Allen, where they both need a lot of time to develop mechanically and mentally, and they both make as many jaw-dropping plays as they do horrible mistakes. However, the upside is there, the work ethic is there, and if there was any team in the league that I think he could find success on, it's the Steelers. So as the fake Pittsburgh GM, I've got a lot of cushion to take this chance. Whether it works or not, it will all likely come down to how my coaching staff can develop him, but it's a risk that I believe I can afford to take, so I'm comfortable taking it. And with that, we move on to pick 29 and one of the biggest speed bumps that the Steelers could not get over last year, the Jacksonville Jaguars. When I look at the Jags roster, I think they've done a great job at slowly rebuilding their offensive line over the last four or five years. They drafted Brandon Linder back in 2014, who's a stud. They stole Cam Robinson in the second round last year, and he had a great rookie season at left tackle. And Andrew Norwell just came over from Carolina last month in free agency as well. All things considered, what was once a pretty atrocious starting five, in my opinion, is now not too shabby. They do, however, still have a pretty decent hole at right guard that can be filled, so I'm going to do my best to push this line from being just above average to being truly really good by drafting Billy Price from Ohio State. Price can play either guard or center, just like Linder, but I think he's an even better puller than Linder and can be used in all sorts of creative ways in space. Whether it's a pin and pull zone play to spring four nets at the edge, or maybe having him pull to the front side on a power play, or even bulldozing through the safety on a tunnel screen, he's both athletic and powerful enough to handle almost any scheme you could dream up. When directly comparing him to James Daniels, even if he's not as quick as Daniels and probably can't play the pivot in a pure zone scheme like him, he has a lot more power and in my opinion maintains a much cleaner pocket in pass protection. His anchor is better, he has an easier time dealing with bull rushes that get underneath his leverage, and for the specific offense that the Jaguars employ, which tends to use very little zone blocking concepts in favor of more gap and power concepts, Price's skill set is a perfect fit. There's a reason I have him going to Jacksonville and Daniels going to Cincinnati, because both of those teams, schematically speaking, are very different and much better fits for these two very different playstyles. So, on the Jaguars offensive line in 2018, we'll have Cam Robinson, a gap scheme mauler at tackle, Andrew Norwell, another gap scheme guard, Brandon Linder, a gap scheme center, and Billy Price, a gap scheme guard or center. That's four young, powerful starters that all fit perfectly in this system and the team's identity of pounding the rock inside. As long as Leonard Fournette stays healthy, this Jags run game, with Billy Price added in the first round, could be an absolute nightmare to deal with. As a Texans fan, I sincerely hope they draft a slot corner or something like that because I really don't want to see Fournette's job made any easier than it already is. 
that would be disastrous for the rest of the AFC South, which of course means it's probably going to happen because Texans fans, as you all know, are not allowed to feel joy. But anyway, I digress. On to Minnesota at pick 30. And pay close attention to this pick on draft night because it's going to have massive ramifications on the franchise when it comes to free agency next season. The Vikings have a big chunk of their young star players on expiring contracts after 2018, and now that Kirk Cousins and Eric Kendricks are eating a ton of their cap, they will not be able to afford to keep everybody. It's just not possible. Anthony Barr is a free agent, Stephon Diggs is a free agent, Daniil Hunter, Sheldon Richardson, and even Trey Waynes will all be on the market, assuming Waynes' fifth year option is not exercised, of course. And in three years, they're going to have to re-sign Cousins yet again, potentially to yet another fully guaranteed contract that's going to be over $30 million a year if he plays well. There is not enough money to go around, so for this pick, I have to approach it as if I'm already planning to replace one of the names on that list, and that name, right now, is Trey Waynes. Out of all of them, he and Richardson are probably my lowest priorities, so I'm just going to preemptively replace Waynes in the 2019 lineup by drafting Mike Hughes out of UCF. Hughes is kind of what I would consider to be an all-around corner compared to his contemporaries in this class. He's not as pure of a zone corner as Josh Jackson, and he's not as good in pure press man as Isaiah Oliver, and he's not as quick in off coverage as Denzel Ward but he's dead in the middle of the Venn diagram between all of these guys. And that's important because the Vikings don't just run one style of coverage. They switch their looks up week to week based on matchups, based on schematic weaknesses, personnel weaknesses. They are arguably the most complex defense in the league to study and of course to learn if you're actually playing in it, which is why Zimmer typically avoids playing rookies. Usually it takes them a full year to figure out what the hell they're supposed to do in this system anyway. So with Hughes, the fact that he can competently play off-man coverage, off-zone coverage, bump and run, or bail into zones from a press alignment, that's big. That he can be successful in all of those styles, even if he's not elite in any singular style, that's perfect for this team. Trey Waynes is pretty much just a press or press bail corner, and he can't do much well besides those things, at least in my opinion, and that's fine. I mean, most corners only have one narrow skill set, but that's not how Minnesota rolls. You have to be able to do a little bit of everything to make this scheme work, and Waynes just does not have that versatility. So in drafting Hughes now before the cap space apocalypse next year, he can sit behind Waynes while he learns the system, the verbiage, the signals and all that, and then take over once Waynes is gone and probably improve this defense in the long run too. It might take a while for the benefits of this pick to show themselves because most rookie corners probably would not play that much in Minnesota, but I'm telling you at some point this Wayne situation needs to be addressed and right now in the first round is probably the best opportunity we're going to get to do it. Let's move on to the Patriots at 31 now with their second pick of this mock draft. I'm going a little bit against the grain here, or actually probably a lot of bit against the grain, so you're going to have to bear with me, but I'm taking Brian O'Neill, left tackle out of Pittsburgh. O'Neill is a phenomenal athlete with a huge frame and long arms, exactly what you want to see in a prototypical left tackle, but he is typically mocked as a day two pick because he's still incredibly raw as a prospect. He lunges a lot, his hand placement is off, his leverage and balance are all over the place sometimes, so I certainly see the flaws in his game and why people think he's a day two pick. However, and this is a big however, because of his athleticism, even when O'Neal's technique is as ugly as sin, he still gets the job done. In the NC State game, he was even giving Bradley Chubb problems consistently because he was so quick and so strong that he could recover even after he was beat and keep Chubb in check. And I don't know about you guys, but when I see any offensive tackle frustrate Bradley Chubb as much as O'Neal did, that gets my attention. I said the same thing last year when Cam Robinson gave Miles Garrett a whole bunch of problems in college, and then Robinson ended up going in round two, but he played like a bona fide first round left tackle. If you have a performance like that on your resume against a slam dunk franchise pass rusher, it matters. It matters a lot, and you should not be a day two pick in my opinion. That game shows that O'Neal has a lot of talent. It shows that he can survive against the best that college football has to offer. And once he's developed and refined, he's going to be a very good tackle at the next level. And who better to develop and refine him than Dante Scarnecchia, one of the greatest, if not the greatest offensive line coach that the NFL has ever seen. He's been with the Patriots for decades now, and he's turned a lot of average talents into good offensive linemen and good talents into great offensive linemen. O'Neal would probably be the most talented player that Skarnecki has gotten to work with since New England drafted Nate Solder back in 2011, and in some ways, O'Neal is even more talented than Solder. 
He's so gifted that Pitt would even throw him the ball sometimes and let him show off his tight end background in the open field just because they could. He's that athletic. If I'm Bill Belichick, I'm not drafting O'Neal for what he is right now. I'm drafting him for what I believe Skarniakia can turn him into, which is a Pro Bowl caliber left tackle. He can protect Tom Brady for the remaining years of his career and eventually give the franchise some stability on their offensive line for whatever young QB ends up being the next man up. I know that this pick will seem off the wall to a lot of people, but just think of it this way. I'm placing my faith into two of the greatest coaches in NFL history to make the most out of this kid. If you believe in Belichick and Skarniecki as much as I do, then really it's not that hard of a bet to make. And with that, we have finally arrived at the final pick of the first round with the reigning champion Philadelphia Eagles. This is a roster with virtually no holes, which I suppose is to kind of be expected from a team that just won the whole damn thing. So really, I'm not trying to fill any immediate needs here, but rather just fill some future needs that are likely to arise after this season. With Jay Ajayi in the final year of his rookie deal, I'm going to look to save some money at that position and draft a brand new rookie to eventually replace him in Georgia's Sony Michelle. Michelle is a great fit for Doug Peterson's zone run system as a no-nonsense one-cut runner that excels at waiting for a single crease to develop and then exploding through it with as much power as he can muster. Stylistically, uh, to me at least, he's very similar to Derrick Henry when he was coming out of Bama a couple years ago in that they both love running through contact and neither one of them dance in the backfield waiting for the perfect lane to open up. They will of course string out their runs laterally like all zone runners do, but even if the lane isn't necessarily clean, they have no qualms about just lowering their shoulders and powering through people to get to where they want to go. It's a very delicate balance of patience and aggression that if you can master it, it really makes a difference in a zone heavy system and Michelle was a master of keeping that balance at Georgia. As an Eagle, I think Michelle can round out a fantastic three-headed monster with Ajayi and Corey Clement during his rookie year before taking over a more prominent role in 2019 when Ajayi inevitably gets a larger contract somewhere else. It's both a cost-saving move and it potentially makes the offense even better in the short term, so that's about as win-win of a pick as I can make in this scenario. So, there you all have it, that was the final pick of the second annual Film Room Mock Draft. Thank you to everyone who managed to get through this whole thing and listen to my rather long-winded explanations for every single pick. I hope you guys sincerely enjoyed it. Obviously, there were a lot of big-name players left out of this mock, but trust me, that was not easy to do. There are so many prospects in this class that can be considered in the first round that mathematically, it's impossible to include them all. So if a player you really like on tape did not make it into my top 32, don't take that as a criticism of them as prospects, but rather as an example of how loaded this class really is at the top. There is a ton of talent in this group, and I think we're going to see a lot of them making big names for themselves early on. So regardless of what happens on draft night, get ready for a major, major infusion of talent into the NFL in 2018. With that, thank you again to everyone for watching, participating, communicating, and overall helping this channel grow throughout this pre-draft season. It's always been one of the best three-month periods of the year for me because I love the draft so much, and I always get so excited when it's so close by on the calendar. And this draft season, uh, truth be told, was kind of excruciating to wait through because... Uh, you know, all the medical stuff I was dealing with that kept me from making videos for a few weeks. It was really hard to not work, uh, which I guess is kind of super not healthy when you think about it, but it's true. I really love my job. I love making content for you guys. I'm so happy to be back and be able to put in all these, these hours to make this mock for you. I must have put in, God, two to 250 hours into this thing, but you know, I, I loved every one of them. So thank you again to everyone for your support. Thank you to everyone who keeps this channel alive by donating to my Patreon. You guys are the real MVP, and I hope you all enjoy the uh, the actual draft later this week. I'll see you back here next week, of course, with a post-draft analysis podcast-ish type of show, just like I did last year, if you all kind of watched that, or I guess it was really more of just listen to it. But anyway, with any luck, I'll get at least a couple picks right that I can gloat about. I'm feeling pretty good about Darnold. Uh, everything after that is totally up in the air, but... That's the fun of the draft is you never really know what's going to happen. So I'm super psyched. I know you guys are psyched and I'll see you next week. Until then, later.